Chapter 15. Ricardo's Theory of Surplus Value Part A. The Connection Between Ricardo's Conception of Surplus Value and His Views on Profit and Rent Section 1. Ricardo's Confusion of the Laws of Surplus Value with the Laws of Profit Nowhere does Ricardo consider surplus value separately and independently from its particular forms, profit, interest, and rent. His observations on the organic composition of capital, which is of such decisive importance, are therefore confined to those differences in the organic composition which he took over from Adam Smith, actually from the physiocrats, namely those arising from the process of circulation, fixed and circulating capital. Nowhere does he touch on or perceive the differences in the organic composition within the actual process of production. Hence his confusion of value with cost price, his wrong theory of rent, his erroneous laws relating to the causes of the rise and fall in the rate of profit, etc. Profit and surplus value are only identical when the capital advanced is identical with the capital laid out directly in wages. Rent is not taken into account here, since the surplus value is, in the first place, entirely appropriated by the capitalist, irrespective of what portion he has subsequently to hand over to his co-partners. Furthermore, Ricardo himself presents rent as an item which is separated, detached from profit. In his observations on profit and wages, Ricardo also abstracts from the constant part of capital, which is not laid out in wages. He treats the matter as though the entire capital were laid out directly in wages. To this extent, therefore, he considers surplus value and not profit, hence it is possible to speak of his theory of surplus value. On the other hand, however, he thinks that he is dealing with profit as such, and in fact, views which are based on the assumption of profit and not of surplus value constantly creep in. Where he correctly sets forth the laws of surplus value, he distorts them by immediately expressing them as laws of profit. On the other hand, he seeks to present the laws of profit directly, without the intermediate links, as laws of surplus value. When we speak of his theory of surplus value, we are therefore speaking of his theory of profit, insofar as he confuses the latter with surplus value, i.e. insofar as he only considers profit in relation to variable capital, the part of capital laid out in wages. We shall later deal with what he says of profit as distinct from surplus value. It is so much in the nature of the subject matter that surplus value can only be considered in relation to the variable capital, i.e. the capital laid out directly in wages, that Ricardo treats the entire capital as variable capital and abstracts from constant capital, although he occasionally mentions it in the form of advances. In Chapter 26, on Gross and Net Revenue, Ricardo speaks of, quote, "...trades where profits are in proportion to the capital and not in proportion to the quantity of labor employed." End quote. What does his whole doctrine of average profit, on which his theory of rent depends, mean but that profits are in proportion to the capital and not in proportion to the quantity of labor employed? If they were in proportion to the quantity of labor employed, then equal capitals would yield very unequal profits, since their profit would be equal to the surplus value created in their own sphere of production. The surplus value, however, depends not on the size of the capital as a whole, but on the size of the variable capital, which is equivalent to the quantity of labor employed. What, then, is the meaning of attributing to a specific use of capital, to specific trades by way of exception, that in them profits are proportionate to the amount of capital and not to the quantity of labor employed? With a given rate of surplus value, the amount of surplus value for a particular capital must always depend not on the absolute size of the capital, but on the quantity of labor employed. On the other hand, if the average rate of profit is given, the amount of profit must always depend on the size of the capital employed, and not on the quantity of labor. Ricardo expressly mentions the carrying trade, the distant foreign trade, and trades where expensive machinery is required. That is to say, he speaks of trades which employ relatively large amounts of constant and little variable capital. At the same time, they are trades in which, compared with others, the total amount of the capital advanced is large, or which can only be carried on with large capitals. If the rate of profit is given, the amount of profit depends entirely on the size of the capitals advanced. This, however, by no means distinguishes the trades in which large capitals and much constant capital are employed, the two always go together, from those in which small capitals are employed, but is merely an application of the theory that equal capitals yield equal profits. A larger capital, therefore, yields more profit than a smaller capital.
This has nothing to do with the quantity of labor employed, but whether the rate of profit in general is great or small depends indeed on the total quantity of labor employed by the capital of the whole class of capitalists and on the proportion of unpaid labor, and lastly, on the ratio of the capital spent on labor and the capital that is merely reproduced as a condition of production. Ricardo himself argues against Adam Smith's view that the great profits which are sometimes made by particular merchants in foreign trade will elevate the general rate of profits in the country. Ricardo says, quote, They contend that the equality of profits will be brought about by the general rise of profits, and I am of opinion that the profits of the favored trade will speedily subside to the general level. We shall see later how far his view is correct that exceptional profits, when they are not caused by the rise in market price above the value, do not raise the general rate of profit in spite of the equalization of profits, and also how far his view is correct that foreign trade and the expansion of the market cannot raise the rate of profit. But granted that he is right, and on the whole granted the equality of profits, how can he distinguish between trades where profits are in proportion to the capital and others where they are in proportion to the quantity of labor employed? In chapter 26 on gross and net revenue quoted above, Ricardo says, I admit that from the nature of rent, a given capital employed in agriculture, on any but the land last cultivated, puts in motion a greater quantity of labor than an equal capital employed in manufactures and trade. The whole statement is nonsense. In the first place, according to Ricardo, a greater quantity of labor is employed on the land last cultivated than on all the other land. That is why, according to him, rent arises on the other land. How, therefore, is a given capital to set in motion a greater quantity of labor than in manufactures and trade on all other land except the land last cultivated? That the product of the better land has a market value that is higher than the individual value, which is determined by the quantity of labor employed by the capital that cultivates it, is surely not the same thing as that this capital puts in motion a greater quantity of labor than an equal capital employed in manufactures and trade. But it would have been correct, had Ricardo said, that apart from the differences in the fertility of the land, Altogether, rent arises because agricultural capital sets in motion a greater quantity of labor in proportion to the constant part of the capital than does the average non-agricultural capital. Ricardo overlooks the fact that with a given surplus value, various factors may raise or lower and in general influence the rate of profit. Because he identifies surplus value with profit, he quite consistently seeks to demonstrate that the rise and fall in the rate of profit is caused only by circumstances that make the rate of surplus value rise or fall. Apart from the circumstances, which, when the amount of surplus value is given, influence the rate of profit, although not the amount of profit, he furthermore overlooks the fact that the rate of profit depends on the amount of surplus value and by no means on the rate of surplus value. When the rate of surplus value, i.e. of surplus labor, is given, the amount of surplus value depends on the organic composition of the capital, that is to say, on the number of workers which a capital of a given value, for instance 100 pounds, employs. It depends on the rate of surplus value if the organic composition of the capital is given. It is thus determined by two factors, the number of workers simultaneously employed and the rate of surplus labor. If the capital increases, then the amount of surplus value also increases whatever its organic composition, provided it remains unchanged. But this in no way alters the fact that for a capital of a given value, for example 100, the amount of surplus value remains the same. If in this case it is 10, then it is 100 for 1000, but this does not alter the proportion. There cannot be two rates of profit in the same employment. And therefore, when the value of produce is in different proportions to capital, it is the rent which will differ, and not the profit. This only applies to the normal rate of profit in the same employment. Otherwise, it is in direct contradiction to the statements quoted earlier on. The exchangeable value of all commodities, whether they be manufactured, or produce of the mines, or the produce of the land, is always regulated, not by the less quantity of labor that will suffice for their production under circumstances highly favorable and exclusively enjoyed by those who have peculiar facilities of production, but by the greater quantity of labor necessarily bestowed on their production by those who have no such facilities, by those who continue to produce them under the most unfavorable circumstances, meaning, by the most unfavorable circumstances, the most unfavorable under which the quantity of produce required renders it necessary to carry on the production.
In Chapter 12, Land Tax, Ricardo incidentally makes the following remark directed against Say. It shows that the Englishman is always very conscious of the economic distinctions, whereas the Continental constantly forgets them. Mr. Say supposes a landlord, by his economy and skill, to increase his annual revenue by 5,000 francs. But a landlord has no means of employing his economy and skill on his land, unless he farms it himself. And then it is in quality of capitalist and farmer that he makes the improvement, and not in quality of landlord. It is not conceivable that he could so augment the produce of his farm by any peculiar skill, the skill, therefore, is more or less empty talk, on his part, without first increasing the quantity of capital employed upon it. In Chapter 13, Taxes on Gold, important for Ricardo's theory of money, Ricardo makes some additional reflections, or further definitions, relating to market price and natural price. They amount to this. How long the equalization of the two prices takes depends on whether the particular sphere of production permits a rapid or slow increase or reduction of supply, which in turn is equivalent to a rapid or slow transfer or withdrawal of capital to or from the sphere in question. Ricardo has been criticized by many writers, sees Mondi, etc., because, in his observations on rent, he disregards the difficulties that the withdrawal of capital presents for the farmer who employs a great deal of fixed capital. The history of England from 1815 to 1830 provides strong proof for this. Although this objection is quite correct, it does not in any way affect the theory. It leaves it quite untouched, because in this case, it is invariably only a question of the more or less rapid or slow operation of the economic law. But as regards the reverse objection, which refers to the application of new capital to new land, the situation is quite different. Ricardo assumes that this can take place without the intervention of the landlord, that in this case, capital is operating in a field of action in which it does not meet with any resistance. But this is fundamentally wrong. In order to prove this assumption, that this is indeed so, where capitalist production and landed property are developed, Ricardo always presupposes cases in which landed property does not exist, either in fact or in law, and where capitalist production too is not yet developed, at least not on the land. The statements just referred to are the following. The rise in the price of commodities in consequence of taxation or of difficulty of production will in all cases ultimately ensue, but the duration of the interval before the market price will conform to the natural price must depend on the nature of the commodity and on the facility with which it can be reduced in quantity. If the quantity of the commodity taxed could not be diminished, if the capital of the farmer, or of the hatter, for instance, could not be withdrawn to other employments, it would be of no consequence that their profits were reduced below the general level by means of a tax. Unless the demand for their commodity should increase, they would never be able to elevate the market price of corn and of hats up to their increased natural price. Their threats to leave their employments and remove their capitals to more favored trades would be treated as an idle menace which could not be carried into effect, and consequently, the price would not be raised by diminished production. Commodities, however, of all descriptions can be reduced in quantity, and capital can be removed from trades which are less profitable to those which are more so, but with different degrees of rapidity. In proportion, as the supply of a particular commodity can be more easily reduced, Without inconvenience to the producer, the price of it will more quickly rise after the difficulty of its production has been increased by taxation or by any other means. The agreement of the market and natural price of all commodities depends at all times on the facility with which the supply can be increased or diminished. In the case of gold, houses, and labor, as well as many other things, this effect cannot, under some circumstances, be speedily produced but it is different with those commodities which are consumed and reproduced from year to year, such as hats, shoes, corn, and cloth. They may be reduced if necessary, and the interval cannot be long before the supply is contracted in proportion to the increased charge of producing them. Section 2. Changes in the rate of profit caused by various factors. In the same chapter 13, Taxes on Gold, Ricardo speaks of rent being not a creation, but merely a transfer of wealth. Is profit a creation of wealth, or is it not rather a transfer of the surplus labor from the workman to the capitalist? In fact, wages too are not a creation of wealth, but they are not a transfer. They are the appropriation of part of the produce of labor by those who produced it, 
In the same chapter, Ricardo says, A tax on raw produce from the surface of the earth will fall on the consumer and will in no way affect rent, unless by diminishing the funds for the maintenance of labor, it lowers wages, reduces the population, and diminishes the demand for corn. Whether Ricardo is right when he says that a tax on raw produce from the surface of the earth falls neither on the landlord nor on the farmer, but on the consumer, does not concern us here. I maintain, however, that if he is right, such a tax may raise the rent, whereas he thinks that it does not affect it, unless by increasing the price of the means of subsistence it diminishes capital, population, and the demand for corn, etc. For Ricardo imagines that an increase in the price of raw produce only affects the rate of profit insofar as it raises the price of the means of subsistence for the worker. And it is true that an increase in the price of raw produce can only in this way affect the rate of surplus value, and consequently surplus value itself, thereby affecting the rate of profit. But assuming a given surplus value, an increase in the price of the raw produce from the surface of the earth would raise the value of constant capital in proportion to the variable, would increase the ratio of constant capital to variable, and therefore reduce the rate of profit, thus raising the rent. Ricardo starts out from the viewpoint that insofar as the rise or fall in the price of the raw produce does not affect wages, it does not affect profit, for he argues, except in one passage to which we shall return at a later stage, that the rate of profit remains the same whether the value of the capital advanced falls or rises. If the value of the capital advanced grows, then the value of the product grows, and also the part of the product which forms the surplus product, i.e. profit. The reverse happens when the value of the capital advanced falls. Ricardo's assertion is only correct if the values of variable and constant capital change in the same proportion, whether the change is caused by a rise in the price of raw materials or by taxes, etc. In this case, the rate remains unaffected, because no change has occurred in the organic composition of the capital. And even then, it must be assumed, as is the case with temporary changes, that wages remain the same, whether the price of raw produce rises or falls. In other words, their value remains unchanged irrespective of any rise or fall in the use value of the wages. The following possibilities exist. First, the two major differences. A. A change in the method of production brings about a change in the proportion between the amounts of constant and variable capital employed. In this case, the rate of surplus value remains the same provided wages remain constant in terms of value, i.e. in terms of the labor time that they represent. But the surplus value itself is affected if a different number of workers is employed by the same capital, i.e. if there is an alteration in the variable capital. If the change in the method of production results in a relative fall in constant capital, the surplus value grows, and thus the rate of profit. The reverse case produces the opposite result. It is here assumed that the value to that extent, per 100 pounds for example, of constant and variable capital remains the same. In this case, the change in the method of production cannot affect constant and variable capital equally. That is, for instance, constant and variable capital, without a change in value, cannot increase or diminish to the same extent, for the fall or rise is here always the result of a change in the productivity of labor. A change in the method of production has not the same, but a different effect on constant and variable capital, and this has nothing to do with whether a large or small amount of capital has to be employed with a given organic composition. b. The method of production remains the same. There is a change in the ratio of constant to variable capital, while their relative volume in physical units remains the same, so that each of them forms the same proportion of the total capital as before. This change in their ratio is caused by a change in the value of the commodities which enter into constant or variable capital. The following possibilities exist here. 1. The value of the constant capital remains the same while that of the variable capital rises or falls. This would always affect the surplus value and thereby the rate of profit. 2. The value of the variable capital remains the same, while that of the constant rises or falls. Then the rate of profit would fall in the first case and rise in the second. 3. If both fall simultaneously but in different proportions, then the one has always risen or fallen as compared with the other. Or 4. The value of the constant and of the variable capital is equally affected, whether both rise or both fall. If both rise, then the rate of profit falls, not because the constant capital rises, but because the variable capital rises, and accordingly the surplus value falls, for only the value of the variable capital rises, although it sets in motion the same number of workers as before, or perhaps even a smaller number.
If both fall, then the rate of profit rises, not because the constant capital falls, but because the variable capital falls, in terms of value, and therefore the surplus value increases. C. Change in the method of production and change in the value of the elements that form constant or variable capital. Here, one change may neutralize the other. For example, when the amount of constant capital grows while its value falls or remains the same or when its amount falls but its value rises in the same proportion or remains the same. In this case, there would be no change at all in the organic composition. The rate of profit would remain unchanged. But it can never happen, except in the case of agricultural capital, that the amount of the constant capital falls as compared with the variable capital while its value rises. This type of nullification cannot possibly apply to variable capital while the real wage remains unchanged. Except for this one case, it is therefore only possible for the value and the amount of constant capital to fall or rise simultaneously in relation to the variable capital. Its value, therefore, rises or falls absolutely as compared with the variable capital. This case has already been considered, or they may fall or rise simultaneously but in unequal proportion. On the assumption made, this possibility always reduces itself to the case in which the value of the constant capital rises or falls relatively to the variable. This also includes the other case, for if the amount of constant capital rises, then the amount of variable capital falls relatively, and vice versa, similarly with the value. Section 3. The value of constant capital decreases while that of variable capital increases, and vice versa, and the effect of these changes on the rate of profit. In regard to case C, it should also be noted it would be possible for the wages to rise, but for constant capital to fall in terms of value, not in physical terms. If the rise and fall were proportional on both sides, the rate of profit could remain unchanged. For instance, if the constant capital were 60 pounds, wages 40 pounds, and the rate of surplus value 50%, then the product would be 120 pounds. The rate of profit would be 20%. If the constant capital fell to 40, although its volume in physical terms remained unchanged, and wages rose to 60, while the surplus value fell from 50% to 33 and a third percent, then the product would be 120 and the rate of profit 20%. This is wrong. According to the assumption, the total value of the quantity of labor employed is 60 pounds. Hence, if the wage rose to 60 pounds, surplus value, and therefore the rate of profit, would be nil. But if it did not rise to such an extent, then any rise in the wage would bring about a fall in the surplus value. If wages rose to 50 pounds, then the surplus value would be 10. If they rose to 45, the surplus would be 15, etc. Under all circumstances, therefore, the surplus value and the rate of profit would fall to the same degree. For we are measuring the unchanged total capital here. While the magnitude of the capital, the total capital, remains the same, the rate of profit must always rise and fall, not with the rate of surplus value, but with the absolute amount of surplus value. But if, in the above example, the flax fell so low that the amount which the same number of workers were spinning could be bought for 40 pounds, then we would have the following. Constant capital, 40. Variable capital, 50. Surplus value, 10. Value of the product, 100. The capital advanced, 90. The rate of profit at 11 and 1 ninth percent. The rate of profit would have fallen below 20%. But supposing the following, constant capital at 30, variable capital at 50, surplus value at 10, value of the product, 90, capital advanced at 80, rate of profit, 12.5%. And supposing, constant capital at 20, variable capital at 50, surplus value at 10, the value of the product is 80, capital advanced is 70, and the rate of profit is 14 and 2 sevenths percent. According to the assumption, the fall in the value of the constant capital never completely counterbalances the rise in the value of the variable capital. On the assumption made, it can never entirely cancel it out, since for the rate of profit to be 20, 10 pounds would have to be a fifth of the total capital advanced. But in the case in which the variable capital amounts to 50 pounds, this would only be possible when the constant capital is nil. Assume, on the other hand, that variable capital rose only to 45. In this case, the surplus value would be 15. And say the constant capital fell to 30. The value of the product is 90, the capital advanced is 75, and the rate of profit is 20%. In this case, the two movements cancel each other out entirely. Assume further. Constant capital at 20, variable capital at 45, surplus value at 15, value of the product being 80, the capital advance being 65, and the rate of profit is 23 and 1 over 13%. Even with the fall in the surplus value, therefore, the rate of profit could rise in this case, 
because of the proportionately greater fall in the value of the constant capital. More workers could be employed with the same capital of 100, despite the rise in wages and the fall in the rate of surplus value. Despite the fall in the rate of surplus value, the amount of surplus value, and hence the profit, would increase, because the number of workers had increased. For the above ratio of 20 constant and 45 variable gives us the following proportions with a capital outlay of 100. Constant capital at 30 and 10 thirteenths, variable capital at 69 and 3 thirteenths, surplus value at 23 and 1 thirteenths. The value of the product is 123 and 1 thirteenths, the capital advanced is 100, and the rate of profit is 23 and 1 thirteenth percent. The relation between the rate of surplus value and the number of workers becomes very important here. Ricardo never considers it. It is clear that what has been regarded here as a variation within the organic composition of one capital can apply equally to the difference in the organic composition between different capitals, capitals in different spheres of production. Firstly, instead of a variation in the organic composition of one capital, a difference in the organic composition of different capitals. Secondly, alteration in the organic composition through a change in value in the two parts of one capital. Similarly, a difference in the value of the raw materials and machinery employed by different capitals. This does not apply to variable capital, since equal wages in the different branches of production are assumed. The difference in the value of different days of labor in different spheres has nothing to do with it. If the labor of a goldsmith is dearer than that of another worker, then the surplus time of the goldsmith is proportionately dearer than that of the other worker. Section 4. Confusion of cost prices with value in the Ricardian theory of profit. In Chapter 15, Taxes on Profits, Ricardo says, Taxes on those commodities which are generally denominated luxuries fall on those only who make use of them. But taxes on necessaries do not affect the consumers of necessaries in proportion to the quantity that may be consumed by them, but often in a much higher proportion. For example, a tax on corn alters the rate of profits of stock. Whatever raises the wages of labor lowers the profits of stock, and therefore every tax on any commodity consumed by the worker has a tendency to lower the rate of profits. Taxes on consumers are at the same time taxes on producers, insofar as the object taxed enters not only into individual consumption, but also into industrial consumption, or only into the latter. This does not, however, apply only to the necessaries consumed by workmen. It applies to all materials industrially consumed by the capitalist. Every tax of this kind reduces the rate of profit because it raises the value of the constant capital in relation to the variable. For example, a tax imposed on flax or wool. The flax rises in price. The flax spinner can therefore no longer purchase the same quantity of flax with a capital of 100 pounds. Since the method of production has remained the same, he needs the same number of workers to spin the same quantity of flax. But the flax has a greater value than before in relation to the capital laid out in wages. The rate of profit therefore falls. It does not help him at all that the price of linen yarn rises. The absolute level of this price is in fact immaterial to him. What matters is only the excess of this price over the price of the capital advanced. If he wanted to raise the price of the total product, not only by the amount necessary to cover the increase in the price of flax, but to such an extent that the same quantity of yarn would yield him the same profit as before, then the demand, which is already falling as a result of the rising price of the raw material of the yarn, would fall still further because of the artificial rise due to the higher profit. Although the average rate of profit is given, it is not possible in such cases to raise the price in this way. In the same chapter, Ricardo says, In a former part of this work, we discuss the effects of the division of capital into fixed and circulating, or rather into durable and perishable capital on the prices of commodities. We showed that two manufacturers might employ precisely the same amount of capital and might derive from it precisely the same amount of profits, but that they would sell their commodities for very different sums of money, according as the capitals they employed were rapidly or slowly consumed and reproduced. The one might sell his goods for £4,000, the other for 10000 and they might both employ £10,000 of capital and obtain 20% profit, or £2,000. The capital of one might consist, for example, of 2,000 circulating capital to be reproduced and 8,000 fixed in buildings and machinery. The capital of the other, on the contrary, might consist of 8,000 circulating and only 2,000 fixed capital in machinery and buildings. Now if each of these persons were to be taxed 10% on his income, or 200 pounds, the one to make his business yield him the general rate of profit must raise his goods from 10,000 to 10,200, 
the other would also be obliged to raise the price of his goods from 4,000 to 4,200. Before the tax, the goods sold by one of these manufacturers were two and a half times more valuable than the goods of the other. After the tax, they will be 2.42 times more valuable. The one kind will have risen 2%, the other 5%. Consequently, a tax upon income, whilst money continued unaltered in value, would alter the relative prices and value of commodities. The error lies in this final and, prices and value. This change of prices would only show, just as in the case of capital containing different proportions of fixed and circulating capital, that the establishment of the general rate of profit requires that the prices, or cost prices, which are determined and regulated by that general rate of profit, are very different from the values of the commodities. And this most important aspect of the question does not exist for Ricardo at all. In the same chapter, he says, if a country were not taxed, and money should fall in value, its abundance in every market, here he expresses the absurd notion that a fall in the value of money ought to be accompanied by its abundance in every market, would produce similar effects in each. If meat rose 20%, bread, beer, shoes, labor, and every commodity would also rise 20%. It is necessary that they should do so, to secure to each trade the same rate of profits. But this is no longer true when any of these commodities is taxed. If, in that case, they should all rise in proportion to the fall in the value of money, profits would be rendered unequal. In the case of the commodities taxed, profits would be raised above the general level, and capital would be removed from one employment to another, till an equilibrium of profits was restored, which could only be after the relative prices were altered. And so this equilibrium of profits is, after all, brought about by the relative values, the real values of the commodities being altered, and so adjusted that they correspond not to their real value, but to the average profit which they must yield. Section 5. The general rate of profit and the rate of absolute rent in their relation to each other. The influence on cost prices of a reduction in wages. In Chapter 17, Taxes on Other Commodities Than Raw Produce, Ricardo says, Mr. Buchanan considers corn and raw produce as at a monopoly price, because they yield a rent. All commodities which yield a rent, he supposes, must be at a monopoly price, and thence he infers that all taxes on raw produce would fall on the landlord and not on the consumer. The price of corn, he says, which always affords a rent, being in no respect influences by the expenses of its production, those expenses must be paid out of the rent. And when they rise or fall, therefore, the consequence is not a higher or lower price, but a higher or lower rent. In this view, all taxes on farm servants, horses, or the implements of agriculture are in reality land taxes, the burden falling on the farmer during the currency of his lease, and on the landlord when the lease comes to be renewed. In like manner, all those improved implements of husbandry which save expense to the farmer, such as machines for threshing and reaping, whatever gives him easier access to the market, such as good roads, canals, and bridges, though they lessen the original cost of corn, do not lessen its market price. Whatever is saved by those improvements, therefore, belongs to the landlord as part of his rent. It is evident, says Ricardo, that if we yield to Mr. Buchanan, the basis on which his argument is built, namely that the price of corn always yields a rent, all the consequences which he contends for would follow, of course. This is by no means evident. What Buchanan bases his argument on is not that all corn yields a rent, but that all corn which yields a rent is sold at a monopoly price, and that monopoly price, in the sense in which Adam Smith explains it, and it has the same meaning with Ricardo, is, quote, the very highest price at which the consumers are willing to purchase it, end quote. But this is wrong. Corn, which yields a rent, apart from differential rent, is not sold at a monopoly price in Buchanan's sense. It is sold at a monopoly price only insofar as it is sold above its cost price and at its value. Its price is determined by the quantity of labor embodied in it, not by the cost of producing it, and the rent is the excess of the value over the cost price. It is therefore determined by the latter. The smaller is the cost price relatively to the value, the greater will be the rent, and the greater the cost price in relation to the value, the smaller the rent. All improvements lower the value of corn because they reduce the quantity of labor required for its production. Whether they reduce the rent depends on various circumstances. If the corn becomes cheaper, and if wages are thereby reduced, then the rate of surplus value rises. Furthermore, the farmer's expenses in seeds, fodder, etc. would fall, 
and therewith the rate of profit in all other non-agricultural branches of production would rise, hence also in agriculture. The relative amounts of immediate and accumulated labor would remain unchanged in the non-agricultural spheres of production. The number of workers in relation to constant capital would remain the same, but the value of the variable capital would fall. The surplus value would therefore rise, and also the rate of profit. Consequently, they would also rise in agriculture. Rent falls here because the rate of profit rises. Corn becomes cheaper, but its cost price rises. Hence, the difference between its value and its cost price falls. According to our assumption, the ratio for the average non-agricultural capital was 80 constant and 20 variable. The rate of surplus value 50%, hence surplus value at 10 pounds and the rate of profit 10%. The value of the product of the average capital of 100 pounds was therefore 110. If one assumes that as a result of the lowering of the price of grain, wages fell by one quarter, then the same number of workers employed on a constant capital of 80 pounds, that is, on the same amount of raw material and machinery, would now cost only 15 pounds. And the same amount of commodities would be worth 80 constant, 15 variable, and 15 surplus, since, according to the assumption, the quantity of labor which they perform equals 30. Thus, the value of the same amount of commodities is 110, as before but the capital advanced would now amount only to 95, and the rate of profit, 15 on 95, would be 15 and 15 over 19%. If, however, the same amount of capital were laid out, that is 100 pounds, then the ratio would be 84 and 4 19ths constant to 15 and 15 19 variable. The profit, however, would be 15 and 15 19 and the value of the product would amount to 115 and 15 19 According to the assumption, however, the agricultural capital was 60 constant and 40 variable, and the value of its product was 120. Rent was 10, while the cost price was 110. Now the rent would only be 4 and 4 nineteenths. For 115 and 15 nineteenths, plus 4 and 4 nineteenths equals 120. We see here that the average capital of 100 pounds produces commodities at a cost price of 115 and 15 nineteenths instead of the previous 110. Has this caused the average price of the commodity to rise? Its value has remained the same, since the same amount of labor is required to transform the same amount of raw material and machinery into product. But the same capital of 100 pounds sets in motion more labor, and while previously it transformed 80 pounds, now it transforms 84 and 4 nineteenths constant capital into product. A greater proportion of this labor is, however, now unpaid. Hence, there is an increase in profit and in the total value of the commodities produced by a capital of 100 pounds. The value of the individual commodity has remained the same, but more commodities at the same value are being produced with the capital of 100. What is, however, the position of the cost price in the individual branches of production? Let us assume that the aggregate non-agricultural capital consisted of the capitals in the following table. Thus, the average capital is 80 constant and 20 variable. For number 2, the difference is minus 10. For number 3 and number 4 taken together, it's plus 10. For the whole capital of 400 pounds, it is 0. If the product of the capital of 400 pounds is sold at 440, then the commodities produced by it are sold at their value. This yields a profit of 10%. But in case number 2, the commodities are sold at 10 pounds below their value. In case number 3, at 2.5 pounds above their value, and in case number 4, at 7.5 pounds above their value. Only in case number 1 are they sold at their value if they are sold at their cost price, i.e. 100 pounds capital plus 10 pounds profit. But what would be the situation as a result of the fall in wages by one quarter? For capital number 1, instead of 80 constant and 20 variable, the outlay is now 84 and 4 nineteenths constant and 15 and 15 nineteenths variable. The profit is 15 and 15 nineteenths pounds, and the value of the product is 115 and 15 nineteenths pounds. For capital number 2, now only 30 pounds are laid out in wages, since one quarter of 40 is 10 and 40 minus 10 is 30. The product is 60 pounds constant and 30 variable, and the surplus value is 30 pounds. For the value of the labor applied is 60. 30 surplus value on a capital of 90 equals 33 and a third percent. For a capital of 100, the ratio is 66 and two-thirds pounds constant to 33 and one-third pound variable, and the value of the product is 133 and a third pounds. The rate of profit is 33 and a third. For capital number 3, now only 11 and a quarter are laid out in wages. For one quarter of 15 is 3 and 3 quarters, and 15 minus 3 and 3 quarters is 11 and 1 quarter. 
the value of the labor applied is 22 and a half pounds. 11 and one quarter on a capital of 96 and one quarter. This amounts to 11 and 53 over 77 percent. For 100 pounds, the ratio is 88 and 24 over 77 constant to 11 and 53 over 77 variable. The rate of profit is 11 and 53 over 77, and the value of the product is 111 and 53 over 77 pounds. For capital number four, now only three and three quarters laid out in wages. For one quarter of five is one and the quarter, and five minus one and the quarter is three and three quarters. The product is 95 pounds constant and three and three quarters pounds variable, and the surplus value is three and three quarters pounds. For the value of the total labor is seven and a half pounds. Three and three quarters on a capital of 98 and three quarters. This amounts to three and 63 over 79%. For 100, the ratio is 96 and 16 over 79 constant, plus three and 63 over 79 variable. The rate of profit is three and 63 seventy-ninths. The value of the product is 103 and 63 seventy-ninths. We would therefore have the following table. This makes 16%, more exactly, a little more than 16 and a seventh percent. The calculation is not quite correct because we have disregarded, not taken into account, a fraction of the average profit. This makes the negative difference in number two appear a little too large, and the positive in number four a little too small. But it can be seen that otherwise, the positive and negative differences would cancel out. Further, it can be seen that on the one hand, the sale of number two below its value, and of number three, and particularly of number four, above their value, would increase considerably. True, the addition to, or reduction of, the price would not be so great for the individual product as might appear here, since in all four categories, more labor is employed and hence more constant capital, that is raw materials and machinery, is transformed into product. The increase or reduction in price would thus be spread over a larger volume of commodities. Nevertheless, it would still be considerable. It is thus evident that a fall in wages would cause a rise in the cost prices of 1, 3, and 4. In fact, a very considerable rise in the cost price of number 4. It is the same law as that developed by Ricardo in relation to the difference between circulating and fixed capital. But he did not by any means prove, nor could he have proved, that this is reconcilable with the law of value, and that the value of the products remains the same for the total capital. The calculation and the adjustment becomes much more complicated if we take into account those differences in the organic composition of the capital which arise from the circulation process. For in our calculation above, we assumed that the whole of the constant capital which has been advanced enters into the product, i.e. that it contains only the wear and tear of the fixed capital for one year, for example, since we have to calculate the profit for a year. The values of the total product would otherwise be very different, whereas here they only change with the variable capital. Secondly, with a constant rate of surplus value, but varying periods of circulation, there would be greater differences in the amount of surplus value created, relatively to the capital advanced. Leaving out of account any differences in variable capital, the amounts of the surplus values would be proportionate to the amounts of the values created by the same capitals. The rate of profit would be even lower, where a relatively large part of the constant capital consisted of fixed capital, and considerably higher where a relatively large part consisted of circulating capital. It would be highest where the variable capital was relatively large as compared with the constant capital, and where the fixed portion of the latter was at the same time relatively small. If the ratio of circulating to fixed capital and the constant capital were the same in the different capitals, then the only determining factor would be the difference between variable and constant capital. If the ratio of variable to constant capital were the same, then it would be the difference between fixed and circulating capital, that is, only the difference within the constant capital itself. As we have seen above, the farmer's rate of profit would rise in any case if, as a result of the lower price of corn, the general rate of profit of the non-agricultural capital increased. The question is whether his rate of profit would rise directly, and this appears to depend on the nature of the improvements. If the improvements were of such a kind that the capital laid out in wages decreased considerably compared with that laid out in machinery, etc., then his rate of profit need not necessarily rise directly. If, for example, it was such that he required one quarter less workers, then instead of his original outlay of 40 pounds in wages, he would now pay only 30. Thus, his capital would be 60 constant and 30 variable, or in 100 pounds, it would be 66 and two-thirds constant and 33 and a third variable. And since the labor costing 40 pounds provides a surplus value of 20, the labor costing 30 provides 15. And 16 and two-thirds surplus value is derived from labor costing 33 and a third. Thus, the organic composition would approach that of the non-agricultural capital.
And in the above case, with a simultaneous decrease in wages by one quarter, it would fall even below that of the non-agricultural capital. In this case, rent, that is absolute rent, would disappear. Following upon the above-quoted passage on Buchanan, Ricardo says, I hope I have made it sufficiently clear that until a country is cultivated in every part and up to the highest degree, there is always a portion of capital employed on the land which yields no rent, and that it is this portion of capital, the result of which, as in manufactures, is divided between profits and wages, that regulates the price of corn. The price of corn, then, which does not afford a rent, being influenced by the expenses of its production, those expenses cannot be paid out of rent. The consequence, therefore, of those expenses increasing is a higher price and not a lower rent. Since absolute rent is equal to the excess of the value of the agricultural product over its price of production, it is clear that all factors which reduce the total quantity of labor required in the production of corn, etc., reduce the rent, because they reduce the value, hence the excess of the value over the price of production. Insofar as the price of production consists of expenses, its fall is identical and goes hand in hand with the fall in value. But insofar as the price of production, or the expenses, is equal to the capital advance plus the average profit, the very reverse is the case. The market value of the product falls, but that part of it, which is equal to the price of production, rises, if the general rate of profit rises, as a result of the fall in the market value of corn. The rent, therefore, falls, because the expenses, in this sense, rise. And this is how Ricardo takes expenses elsewhere, when he speaks of cost of production. Improvements in agriculture, which bring about an increase in constant capital as compared with variable, would reduce rent considerably, even if the total quantity of labor employed fell only slightly, or so slightly that it did not influence wages, that is, surplus value directly, at all. Suppose, as a result of such improvements, the composition of the capital altered from 60 constant and 40 variable to 66 and two-thirds constant and 33 and a third variable. This might occur, for example, as a result of rising wages caused by emigration, war, discovery of new markets, prosperity in the non-agricultural industry, or it could occur as a result of the competition of foreign corn. The farmer might feel compelled to find means of employing more constant capital and less variable. The same circumstances could continue to operate after the introduction of the improvement, and wages therefore might not fall despite the improvement. Then the value of the agricultural product would be reduced from 120 pounds to 116 and two-thirds, that is, by three and a third. The rate of profit would continue to be 10%. The rent would fall from 10 to six and two-thirds, and moreover, this reduction would have taken place without any reduction whatsoever in wages. The absolute rent may rise because the general rate of profit falls owing to new advances in industry. The rate of profit may fall due to a rise in rent, because of an increase in the value of agricultural produce, which is accompanied by an increase in the difference between its value and its cost price. At the same time, the rate of profit falls because wages rise. The absolute rent can fall because the value of agricultural produce falls and the general rate of profit rises. It can fall because the value of produce falls as a result of a fundamental change in the organic composition of capital, without the rate of profit rising. It can disappear completely as soon as the value of the agricultural produce becomes equal to the cost price. In other words, when the agricultural capital has the same composition as the non-agricultural average capital. Ricardo's proposition would only be correct if expressed like this. When the value of agricultural produce equals its cost price, then there is no absolute rent. But he is wrong because he says there is no absolute rent because value and cost price are altogether identical, both in industry and in agriculture. On the contrary, agriculture would belong to an exceptional class of industry if its value and cost price were identical. Even when admitting that there may be no portion of land which does not pay a rent, Ricardo believes that by referring to the fact that at least some portion of the capital employed on this land pays no rent, he substantially improves his case. The one fact is as irrelevant to the theory as the other. The real question is this. Do the products of these lands, or of this capital, regulate the market value? Or must they not rather sell their products below their value, because their additional supply is only saleable at, not above, this market value, which is regulated without them? So far as the portion of capital is concerned, the matter is simple, because for the farmer who invests an additional amount of capital, landed property does not exist, and as a capitalist, he is only concerned with the cost price, 
If he possesses the additional capital, it is more advantageous to him to invest it on his farm even below the average profit than to lend it out and receive only interest and no profit. So far as the land is concerned, those portions of land which do not pay a rent form component parts of estates that pay rent and are not separable from the estates with which they are let. They cannot, however, be let in isolation from the rest to a capitalist farmer, but perhaps to a cottager or to a small capitalist. In relation to these bits of land, the farmer is again not confronted by landed property. Alternatively, the owner of the land must cultivate it himself. The farmer cannot pay a rent for it, and the landlord does not let it for nothing, unless he wants to have his land made arable in this fashion without incurring any expense. The situation would be different in a country in which the composition of the agricultural capital was equal to the average composition of the non-agricultural capital, which presupposes a high level of development in agriculture, or a low level of development in industry. In this case, the value of the agricultural produce would be equal to its cost price. Only differential rent could be paid then. The land which yields no differential rent, but only an absolute rent, could then pay no rent. For if the farmer sells the agricultural produce at its value, it only covers its cost price. He therefore pays no rent. The landowner must then cultivate the land himself, or the so-called rent collected by him is a part of his tenant's profit, or even of his wages. That this might be the case in one country does not mean that the opposite might not happen in another country. Where, however, industry, and therefore capitalist production, is at a low level of development, there are no capitalist farmers, whose existence would presuppose capitalist production on the land. Thus, quite different circumstances have to be considered here from those involved in the economic organization in which landed property as an economic category exists only in the form of rent. In the same chapter 17, Ricardo says, Raw produce is not at a monopoly price because the market price of barley and wheat is as much regulated by their cost of production as the market price of cloth and linen. The only difference is this, that one portion of the capital employed in agriculture regulates the price of corn, namely that portion which pays no rent, whereas in the production of manufactured commodities, every portion of capital is employed with the same results, and as no portion pays rent, every portion is equally a regulator of price. This assertion that every portion of capital is employed with the same results, and that none pays rent, which is however called excess profit here, is not only wrong but has been refuted by Ricardo himself, as we have seen previously. We now come to the presentation of Ricardo's theory of surplus value. Part B. Ricardo on the problem of surplus value. Section 1. Quantity of labor and value of labor. As presented by Ricardo, the problem of the exchange of labor for capital cannot be solved. Ricardo opens Chapter 1 on value with the following heading of Section 1. The value of a commodity, or the quantity of any other commodity for which it will exchange, depends on the relative quantity of labor which is necessary for its production, and not on the greater or less compensation which is paid for that labor. In the style which runs through the whole of his inquiry, Ricardo begins his book here by stating that the determination of the value of commodities by labor time is not incompatible with wages. In other words, with the varying compensation paid for that labor time, or that quantity of labor. From the very outset, he turns against Adam Smith's confusion between the determination of the value of commodities by the relative quantity of labor required for their production and the value of labor, or the compensation paid for labor. It is clear that the proportional quantity of labor contained in two commodities A and B is absolutely unaffected by whether the workers who produce A and B receive much or little of the product of their labor. The value of A and B is determined by the quantity of labor which their production costs, and not by the costs of labor to the owners of A and B. Quantity of labor and value of labor are two different things. The quantity of labor which is contained in A and B respectively has nothing to do with how much of the labor contained in A and B the owners of A and B have paid or even performed themselves. A and B are exchanged not in proportion to the paid labor contained in them, but in proportion to the total quantity of labor they contain, paid and unpaid. Adam Smith, who so accurately defined the original source of exchangeable value, and who is bound in consistency to maintain that all things became more or less valuable in proportion as more or less labor was bestowed on their production, has himself erected another standard measure of value, 
and speaks of things being more or less valuable in proportion as they will exchange for more or less of this standard measure, as if these were two equivalent expressions, and as if because a man's labor had become doubly efficient, and he could therefore produce twice the quantity of a commodity, he would necessarily receive twice the former quantity in exchange for it, that is, for his labor. If this were indeed true, if the reward of the laborer were always in proportion to what he produced, the quantity of labor bestowed on a commodity and the quantity of labor which that commodity would purchase would be equal, and either might accurately measure the variations of other things, but they are not equal. Adam Smith nowhere asserts that these were two equivalent expressions. On the contrary, he says, because in capitalist production, the wage of the worker is no longer equal to his product, Therefore, the quantity of labor which a commodity costs and the quantity of commodities that the worker can purchase with this labor are two different things. For this very reason, the relative quantity of labor contained in commodities ceases to determine their value, which is now determined rather by the value of labor, by the quantity of labor that I can purchase or command with a given amount of commodities. Thus, the value of labor, instead of the relative quantity of labor, becomes the measure of value. Ricardo's reply to Adam Smith is correct that the relative quantity of labor, which is contained in two commodities, is in no way affected by how much of this quantity of labor falls to the workers themselves, and by the way this labor is remunerated. If the relative quantity of labor was the measure of value of commodities before the supervention of wages, wages that differ from the value of the products themselves, there is therefore no reason at all why it should not continue to be so after wages have come into being. He argues correctly that Adam Smith could use both expressions so long as they were equivalent, but that this is no reason for using the wrong expression instead of the right one when they have ceased to be equivalent. But Ricardo has by no means thereby solved the problem, which is the real cause of Adam Smith's contradiction. Value of labor and quantity of labor remain equivalent expressions so long as it is a question of materialized labor. They cease to be equivalents as soon as materialized labor is exchanged for living labor. Two commodities exchange in proportion to the labor materialized in them. Equal quantities of materialized labor are exchanged for one another. Labor time is their standard measure, but precisely for this reason, they are more or less valuable in proportion as they will exchange for more or less of this standard measure. If the commodity A contains one working day, then it will exchange it against any quantity of commodities which likewise contains one working day, and it is more or less valuable in proportion as it exchanges for more or less materialized labor in other commodities, since this exchange relationship expresses is identical with the relative quantity of labor which it itself contains. Now, wage labor, however, is a commodity. It is even the basis on which the production of products as commodities takes place. The law of values is not applicable to it. Capitalist production, therefore, is not governed at all by this law. Therein lies a contradiction. This is the first of Adam Smith's problems. The second, which we shall find further amplified by Malthus, lies in the fact that the utilization of a commodity as capital is proportional not to the amount of labor it contains, but to the extent to which it commands the labor of others, gives power over more labor of others than it itself contains. This is in fact a second, latent reason for asserting that since the beginning of capitalist production, the value of commodities is determined not by the labor they contain, but by the living labor which they command, in other words, by the value of labor. Ricardo simply answers that this is how matters are in capitalist production. Not only does he fail to solve the problem, he does not even realize its existence in Adam Smith's work. In conformity with the whole arrangement of his investigation, Ricardo is satisfied with demonstrating that the changing value of labor, in short wages, does not invalidate the determination of the value of the commodities, which are distinct from labor itself, by the relative quantity of labor contained in them. They are not equal, that is, quote, the quantity of labor bestowed on a commodity and the quantity of labor which that commodity would purchase, end quote. He contents himself with stating this fact. But how does the commodity labor differ from other commodities? One is living labor and the other materialized labor. They are, therefore, only two different forms of labor. Since the difference is only a matter of form, why should a law apply to one and not the other? Ricardo does not answer. He does not even raise the question. Nor does it help when he says, Is not the value of labor variable, being not only affected, as all other things are, by the proportion between the supply and demand, which uniformly varies with every change in the condition of the community, 
but also by the varying price of food and other necessaries on which the wages of labor are expended. That the price of labor, like that of other commodities, changes with supply and demand proves nothing in regard to the value of labor, according to Ricardo, just as this change of price with supply and demand proves nothing in regard to the value of other commodities. But that the wages of labor, which is only another expression for the value of labor, are affected by, quote, the varying price of food and other necessaries on which the wages of labor are expended, end quote, shows just as little why the value of labor is, or appears to be, determined differently from the value of other commodities. For these, too, are affected by the varying price of other commodities which enter into their production, and against which they are exchanged. That the wages of labor are spent upon food and necessaries means, after all, only that the value of labor is exchanged against food and necessaries. The question is just why labor and the commodities against which it is exchanged do not exchange according to the law of value, i.e. according to the relative quantities of labor. Posed in this way, presupposing the law of value, the question is intrinsically insoluble, because labor as such is counterposed to commodity. A definite quantity of immediate labor as such is counterposed to a definite quantity of materialized labor. This weakness in Ricardo's discourse, as we shall see later, has contributed to the disintegration of his school and led to the proposition of absurd hypotheses. Wakefield is right when he says, quote, Treating labor as a commodity and capital, the produce of labor, as another, then if the value of these two commodities were regulated by equal quantities of labor, a given amount of labor would, under all circumstances, exchange for that quantity of capital which had been produced by the same amount of labor, Antecedent labor would always exchange for the same amount of present labor. It follows that the value of labor in relation to other commodities, insofar at least as wages depend upon share, is determined not by equal quantities of labor, but by the proportion between supply and demand. Thus, the value of a commodity is equally determined by the quantity of materialized, past labor, and by the quantity of living, immediate labor required for its production. In other words, the quantities of labor are in no way affected by the formal difference of whether that labor is materialized or living, past or present. If this difference is of no significance in the determination of the value of commodities, why does it assume such decisive importance when past labor is exchanged against living labor? Why should it, in this case, invalidate the law of value, since the difference in itself, as shown in the case of commodities, has no effect on the determination of value? Ricardo does not answer this question. He does not even raise it. Section 2. Value of labor power, value of labor. Ricardo's confusion of labor with labor power. Concept of the natural price of labor. In order to determine surplus value, Ricardo, like the physiocrats, Adam Smith, etc., must first determine the value of labor power, or as he puts it, following Adam Smith and his predecessors, the value of labor. How, then, is the value or natural price of labor determined? According to Ricardo, the natural price is in fact nothing but the monetary expression of value. Labor, like all other things which are purchased and sold, and which may be increased or diminished in quantity, that is, like all other commodities, has its natural and its market price. The natural price of labor is that price which is necessary to enable the laborers, one with another, to subsist and to perpetuate their race, without either increase or diminution. Should read, with that rate of increase required by the average progress of production. The power of the laborer to support himself and the family which may be necessary to keep up the number of laborers depends on the price of the food, necessaries, and conveniences required for the support of the laborer and his family. With the rise in the price of food and necessaries, the natural price of labor will rise. With a fall in their price, the natural price of labor will fall. It is not to be understood that the natural price of labor, estimated even in food and necessaries, is absolutely fixed and constant. It varies at different times in the same country, and very materially differs in different countries. It essentially depends on the habits and customs of the people. The value of labor is therefore determined by the means of subsistence, which, in a given society, are traditionally necessary for the maintenance and reproduction of the laborers. But why? By what law is the value of labor determined in this way? Ricardo has in fact no answer 
other than that the law of supply and demand reduces the average price of labor to the means of subsistence that are necessary, physically or socially necessary in a given society, for the maintenance of the laborer. He determines value here in one of the basic propositions of the whole system by demand and supply, as Say notes with malicious pleasure. Instead of labor, Ricardo should have discussed labor power, but had he done so, capital would also have been revealed as the material conditions of labor, confronting the laborer as power that had acquired an independent existence, and capital would at once have been revealed as a definite social relationship. Ricardo thus only distinguishes capital as accumulated labor from immediate labor, and it is something purely physical, only an element in the labor process, from which the relation between labor and capital, wages and profits, could never be developed. Capital is that part of the wealth of a country which is employed in production and consists of food, clothing, tools, raw materials, machinery, etc., necessary to give effect to labor. The jump which Ricardo makes here is correctly sensed by Bailey. Quote, Mr. Ricardo, ingeniously enough, avoids a difficulty which, on a first view, threatens to encumber his doctrine, that value depends on the quantity of labor employed in production. If this principle is rigidly adhered to, it follows that the value of labor depends on the quantity of labor employed in producing it, which is evidently absurd. By a dexterous turn, therefore, Mr. Ricardo makes the value of labor depend on the quantity of labor required to produce wages, or to give him the benefit of his own language, he maintains that the value of labor is to be estimated by the quantity of labor required to produce wages, by which he means the quantity of labor required to produce the money or commodities given to the laborer. This is similar to saying that the value of cloth is to be estimated not by the quantity of labor bestowed on its production, but by the quantity of labor bestowed on the production of the silver for which the cloth is exchanged. Literally, the objection raised here is correct. Ricardo distinguishes between nominal and real wages. Nominal wages are wages expressed in money, money wages. Nominal wages are, quote, the number of pounds that may be annually paid to the worker, end quote. But real wages are, quote, the number of days' work necessary to obtain those pounds, end quote. As wages are equal to the necessary means of subsistence of the worker, and the value of these wages, that is the real wages, is equal to the value of these means of subsistence, it is obvious that the value of these necessary means of subsistence is also equal to the real wages, that is, to the labor which they can command. If the value of the means of subsistence changes, then the value of the real wages changes. Assume that the means of subsistence of the worker consist only of corn and that the quantity of means of subsistence which he requires is one quarter of corn per month. Then the value of his wages for one month equals the value of one quarter of corn. If the value of the quarter of corn rises or falls, then the value of the month's labor rises or falls. But however much the value of the quarter of corn rises or falls, however much or little labor the quarter of corn contains, it is always equal to the value of one month's labor. And here we have the hidden reason for Adam Smith's assertion that as soon as capital, and consequently wage labor, intervenes, the value of the product is not regulated by the quantity of labor bestowed upon it, but by the quantity of labor it can command. The value of corn and other means of subsistence determined by labor time changes, but so long as the natural price of labor is paid, the quantity of labor that the quarter of corn can command remains the same. Labor has, therefore, a permanent relative value, as compared with corn. That is why for Smith, too, the value of labor and the value of corn, representing food in general, are standard measures of value, because so long as the natural price of labor is paid, a given quantity of corn always commands the same quantity of labor, whatever the quantity of labor bestowed upon one quarter of corn may be. The same quantity of labor always commands the same use value, or rather the same use value always commands the same quantity of labor. Even Ricardo determines the value of labor in this way. Ricardo says the quarter of corn may have very different values, although it always commands, or is commanded by, the same quantity of labor. Yes, says Adam Smith, however much the value of the quarter of corn determined by labor time may change, the worker must always pay the same quantity of labor in order to buy it. The value of corn therefore alters, but the value of labor does not, since one month's labor equals one quarter of corn. The value of the corn, too, changes only insofar as we are considering the labor required for its production. 
If, on the other hand, we examine the quantity of labor against which it exchanges, which sets it into motion, its value does not change. And that is precisely why the quantity of labor against which a quarter of corn is exchanged is the standard measure of value. But the values of the other commodities have the same relation to labor as they have to corn. A given quantity of corn commands a given quantity of labor. A given quantity of every other commodity commands a certain quantity of corn. Hence, every other commodity, or rather the value of every other commodity, is expressed by the quantity of labor it commands, since it is expressed by the quantity of corn it commands, and the latter is expressed by the quantity of labor it commands. But how is the value of other commodities in relation to means of subsistence determined? By the quantity of labor they command. And how is the quantity of labor they command determined? By the quantity of corn that labor commands. Here, Adam Smith is inevitably caught up in a vicious circle. Incidentally, he never uses this measure of value when making an actual analysis. Moreover, here he confuses, as Ricardo also often does, labor, the intrinsic measure of value, with money, the external measure, which presupposes that value is already determined, although he and Ricardo have declared that labor is, quote, the foundation of the value of commodities, while the comparative quantity of labor which is necessary to their production is the rule which determines the respective quantities of goods which shall be given in exchange for each other. Adam Smith errs when he concludes from the fact that a definite quantity of labor is exchangeable for a definite quantity of use value that this definite quantity of labor is the measure of value and that it always has the same value, whereas the same quantity of use value can represent very different exchange values. But Ricardo errs twice over, firstly because he does not understand the problem which causes Adam Smith's errors, secondly because disregarding the law of value of commodities and taking refuge in the law of supply and demand, he himself determines the value of labor not by the quantity of labor expended in the production of labor power, but by the quantity of labor expended in the production of the wages which the worker receives. Thus, in fact, he says, the value of labor is determined by the value of the money which is paid for it. And what determines this? What determines the amount of money that is paid for it? The quantity of use value that a given amount of labor commands, or the quantity of labor that a definite quantity of use value commands and thereby he falls literally into the very inconsistency which he himself condemned in Smith. This, as we have seen, also prevents him from grasping the specific distinction between commodity and capital, between the exchange of commodity for commodity and the exchange of capital for commodity, in accordance with the law of exchange of commodities. The above example was this. One quarter of corn equals one month's labor, say 30 working days, a working day of 12 hours. In this case, the value of one quarter corn is less than 30 working days. If one quarter corn were the product of 30 working days, the value of the labor would be equal to its product. There would be no surplus value, and therefore no profit, no capital. In actual fact, therefore, if one quarter corn represents the wages for 30 working days, the value of one quarter corn is always less than 30 working days. The surplus value depends on how much less it is. For example, one quarter corn may be equal to 25 working days. Then the surplus value equals five working days, which is one-sixth of the total labor time. If one quarter, being eight bushels, equals 25 working days, then 30 working days are equal to one quarter and one and three-fifths bushels. The value of the 30 working days, i.e. the wage, is therefore always smaller than the value of the product which contains the labor of 30 days. The value of the corn is thus determined not by the labor which it commands, for which it exchanges, but by the labor which is contained in it. On the other hand, the value of the 30 days' labor is always determined by one quarter corn, whatever this may be. Section 3. Surplus Value An analysis of the source of surplus value is lacking in Ricardo's work, his concept of working day as a fixed magnitude. Apart from the confusion between labor and labor power, Ricardo defines the average wages, or the value of labor, correctly, for he says that the value of labor is determined neither by the money nor by the means of subsistence which the laborer receives, but by the labor time which it costs to produce it, that is, by the quantity of labor materialized in the means of subsistence of the worker. This he calls the real wages. This definition of the value of labor, moreover, necessarily follows from his theory, 
Since the value of labor is determined by the value of the necessary means of subsistence on which this value is to be expended, and the value of the means of subsistence, like that of all other commodities, is determined by the quantity of labor they contain, it naturally follows that the value of labor equals the value of the means of subsistence, which equals the quantity of labor expended upon them. However correct this formula is, apart from the direct opposition of labor and capital, it is nevertheless inadequate. Although, in replacement of his wages, the individual laborer does not directly produce or reproduce, taking into account the continuity of this process, products on which he lives, he may produce products which do not enter into his consumption at all, and even if he produces necessary means of subsistence, he may, due to the division of labor, only produce a single part of the necessary means of subsistence, for instance corn, and even that only in one form, for example in that of corn, not bread but he produces commodities to the value of his means of subsistence. That is, he produces the value of his means of subsistence. This means, therefore, if we consider his daily average consumption, that the labor time which is contained in his daily means of subsistence forms one part of his working day. He works one part of the day in order to reproduce the value of his means of subsistence. The commodities which he produces in this part of the working day have the same value or represent a quantity of labor time equal to that contained in his daily means of subsistence. It depends on the value of these means of subsistence, in other words, on the social productivity of labor and not on the productivity of the individual branch of production in which he works, how great a part of his working day is devoted to the reproduction or production of the value, i.e. the equivalent of his means of subsistence. Ricardo, of course, assumes that the labor time contained in the daily means of subsistence is equal to the labor time which the worker must work daily in order to reproduce the value of these. But by not directly showing that one part of the laborer's working day is assigned to the reproduction of the value of his own labor power, he introduces a difficulty and obscures the clear understanding of the relationship. A twofold confusion arises from this. The origin of surplus value does not become clear, and consequently, Ricardo is reproached by his successors for having failed to grasp and expound the nature of surplus value. That is part of the reason for their scholastic attempts at explaining it. But because thus the origin and nature of surplus value is not clearly comprehended, the surplus labor plus the necessary labor, in short, the total working day, is regarded as a fixed magnitude. The differences in the amount of surplus value are overlooked, and the productivity of capital, the compulsion to perform surplus labor, on the one hand to perform absolute surplus labor, and on the other its innate urge to shorten the necessary labor time, are not recognized, and therefore the historical justification for capital is not set forth. Adam Smith, however, had already stated the correct formula. Important as it was to resolve value into labor, it was equally important to resolve surplus value into surplus labor, and to do so in explicit terms. Ricardo starts out from the actual fact of capitalist production. The value of labor is smaller than the value of the product which it creates. The value of the product is therefore greater than the value of the labor which produces it, or the value of the wages. The excess of the value of the product over the value of the wages is the surplus value. Ricardo wrongly uses the word profit, but, as we noted earlier, he identifies profit with surplus value here, and is really speaking of the latter. For him, it is a fact that the value of the product is greater than the value of the wages. How this fact arises remains unclear. The total working day is greater than that part of the working day which is required for the production of the wages. Why? That does not emerge. The magnitude of the total working day is therefore wrongly assumed to be fixed and directly entails wrong conclusions. The increase or decrease in surplus value can therefore be explained only from the growing or diminishing productivity of social labor which produces the means of subsistence. That is to say, only relative surplus value is understood. It is obvious that if the worker needed his whole day to produce his own means of subsistence, i.e. commodities equal to the value of his own means of subsistence, there could be no surplus value, and therefore no capitalist production and no wage labor. This can only exist when the productivity of social labor is sufficiently developed to make possible some sort of excess of the total working day over the labor time required for the production of the wage, i.e. surplus labor, whatever its magnitude. But it is equally obvious that with a given labor time, a given length of the working day, the productivity of labor may be very different. On the other hand, with a given productivity of labor, the labor time, or the length of the working day, may be very different, 
Furthermore, it is clear that though the existence of surplus labor presupposes that the productivity of labor has reached a certain level, the mere possibility of this surplus labor, i.e. the existence of that necessary minimum productivity of labor, does not in itself make it a reality. For this to occur, the worker must first be compelled to work in excess of the necessary time, and this compulsion is exerted by capital. This is missing in Ricardo's work, and therefore also the whole struggle over the regulation of the normal working day. At a low stage of development of the social productivity of labor, that is to say, where surplus labor is relatively small, the class of those who live on the labor of others will generally be small in relation to the number of workers. It can considerably grow proportionately in the measure in which productivity, and therefore relative surplus value, develops. It is moreover understood that the value of labor varies greatly in the same country at different periods, and in different countries during the same period. The temperate zones are, however, the home of capitalist production. The social productive power of labor may be very undeveloped, yet this may be compensated precisely in the production of the means of subsistence, on the one hand by the fertility of the natural agents, such as the land, on the other hand by the limited requirements of the population due to climate, etc. This is, for instance, the case in India. Where conditions are primitive, the minimum wage may be very small, quantitatively in use values, because the social needs are not yet developed, though it may cost much labor. But even if an average amount of labor were required to produce this minimum wage, the surplus value created, although it would be high in proportion to the wage, that is, to the necessary labor time, would, even with a high rate of surplus value, be just as meager, proportionately, when expressed in terms of use values as the wage itself. Let the necessary labor time be 10 hours, the surplus labor 2 hours, and the total working day 12 hours. If the necessary labor time were 12 hours, the surplus labor 2 and 2 fifths hours, and the total working day 14 and 2 fifths hours, then the values produced would be very different. In the first case, they would amount to 12, in the second to 14 and 2 fifths. Similarly, the absolute magnitude of the surplus value. In the former case, it would be 2 hours, in the latter 2 and 2 fifths. And yet, the rate of surplus value, or surplus labor, would be the same, because 2 is to 10, as 2 and 2 fifths is to 12. If, in the second case, the variable capital which is laid out were greater, then so also would be the surplus value or surplus labor appropriated by it. If, in the latter case, the surplus labor would arise by one hour instead of by two-fifths hours, so that it would amount to three hours in the total working day to fifteen, then although the necessary labor time, or the minimum wage, had increased, the rate of surplus value would have risen, for two over ten goes as one-fifth, but three over twelve goes as one-quarter. Both could occur if, as a result of the corn, etc., becoming dearer, the minimum wage had increased from 10 to 12 hours. Even in this case, therefore, not only might the rate of surplus value remain the same, but the amount and rate of surplus value might grow. But let us suppose that the necessary wage amounted to 10 hours, as previously, the surplus labor to 2 hours, and all other conditions remain the same. That is, leaving out of account here any lowering in the production costs of constant capital. Now let the worker work two and two-fifths hours longer and appropriate two hours, while two-fifths form surplus labor. In this case, wages and surplus value would increase in equal proportion, the former, however, representing more than the necessary wage or the necessary labor time. If one takes a given magnitude and divides it into two parts, it is clear that one part can only increase insofar as the other decreases, and vice versa. But this is by no means the case with expanding, that is, elastic, magnitudes. And the working day represents such an elastic magnitude, as long as no normal working day has been won. With such magnitudes, both parts can grow, either to an equal or to unequal extent. An increase in one is not brought about by a decrease in the other, and vice versa. This is, moreover, the only case in which wages and surplus value, in terms of exchange value, can both increase and possibly even in unequal proportions. That they can increase in terms of use value is self-evident. This can increase even if, for example, the value of labor decreases. From 1797 to 1815, when the price of corn and also the nominal wage rose considerably in England, the daily hours of labor increased greatly in the principal industries, which were then in the phase of ruthless expansion. And I believe that this arrested the fall in the rate of profit, because it arrested the fall in the rate of surplus value. In this case, however, Whatever the circumstances, the normal working day is lengthened, and the normal span of life of the worker, hence the normal duration of his labor power, is correspondingly shortened. This applies where a permanent lengthening of the working day occurs. If it is only temporary, in order to compensate for a temporary rise in wages, 
It may, except in the case of children and women, have no other result than to prevent a fall in the rate of profit in those enterprises where the nature of the work makes a prolongation of labor time possible. This is at least possible in agriculture. Ricardo did not consider this at all, since he investigated neither the origin of surplus value nor absolute surplus value, and therefore regarded the working day as a given magnitude. For this case, therefore, his law, that surplus value in wages, he erroneously says profit in wages, in terms of exchange value can rise or fall only in inverse proportion, is incorrect. Firstly, let us assume that the necessary labor time and the surplus labor remain constant. That is, 10 hours plus 2 hours. The working day equals 12 hours, surplus value equals 2 hours, and the rate of surplus value is one-fifth. In the second example, the necessary labor time remains the same. Surplus labor increases from 2 to 4 hours. Hence, a working day of 14 hours, surplus value at 4 hours, and the rate of surplus value is 4 over 10, or 2 fifths. In both cases, the necessary labor time is the same, but the surplus value in the one case is twice as great as in the other, and the working day in the second case is one sixth longer than in the first. Furthermore, although the wage is the same, the values produced, corresponding to the quantities of labor, would be very different. In the first case, it would be equal to 12 hours, and the second to 12 plus 12 over 6 being 14 hours. It is therefore wrong to say that provided the wage is the same in terms of value of necessary labor time, the surplus value contained in two commodities is proportionate to the quantities of labor contained in them. This is only correct where the normal working day is the same. Let us further assume that as a result of the rise in the productive power of labor, the necessary wage, although it remains constant in terms of use values, falls from 10 hours to 9, and similarly that the surplus labor time falls from 2 to 1 and 4 fifths. In this case, 10 is to 9 as 2 is to 1 and 4 fifths. Thus, the surplus labor time would fall in the same proportion as the necessary labor time. The rate of surplus value would be the same in both cases. The quantity of use values that could be bought with the surplus value would, according to the assumption, also remain the same. But this would apply only to those use values which are necessary means of subsistence. The working day would decrease from 12 to 10 and 4 fifths hours. The amount of value produced in the second case would be smaller than that produced in the first, and despite these unequal quantities of labor, the rate of surplus value would be the same in both cases. In discussing surplus value, we have distinguished between surplus value and the rate of surplus value. Considered in relation to one working day, the surplus value is equal to the absolute number of hours which it represents, 2, 3, etc. The rate is equal to the proportion of this number of hours to the number of hours which make up the necessary labor time. This distinction is very important because it indicates the varying length of the working day. If the surplus value equals two hours, then the rate is one-fifth if the necessary labor time is 10 hours, and one-sixth if the necessary labor time is 12 hours. In the first case, the working day consists of 12 hours, and in the second of 14. In the first case, the rate of surplus value is greater, while at the same time, the laborer works a smaller number of hours per day. In the second case, the rate of surplus value is smaller, the value of the labor power is greater, while at the same time the worker works a greater number of hours per day. This shows that with a constant surplus value, but a working day of unequal length, the rate of surplus value may be different. The earlier case shows how with a constant rate of surplus value, but a working day of unequal length, the surplus value itself may be different, in one case two hours and in the other one and four-fifths hours. I have shown previously in chapter 2 that if the length of the working day and the necessary labor time and therefore the rate of surplus value are given, the amount of surplus value depends on the number of workers simultaneously employed by the same capital. This was a tautological statement, for if one working day gives me two surplus hours, then twelve working days give me twenty-four surplus hours, or two surplus days. The statement, however, becomes very important in connection with the determination of profit, which is equal to the proportion of surplus value to the capital advanced, thus depending on the absolute amount of surplus value. It becomes important because capitals of equal size but different organic composition employ unequal numbers of workers. They must thus produce unequal amounts of surplus value, and therefore unequal profits. With a falling rate of surplus value, the profit may rise, and with a rising rate of surplus value the profit may fall or the profit may remain unchanged if a rise or fall in the rate of surplus value is compensated by a counter-movement affecting the number of workers employed. Here we see immediately how extremely wrong it is to identify the laws relating to the rise and fall of surplus value with the laws relating to the rise and fall of profit. If one merely considers the simple law of surplus value, 
then it seems a tautology to say that with a given rate of surplus value and a given length of the working day, the absolute amount of surplus value depends on the amount of capital employed. For an increase in this amount of capital and an increase in the number of workers simultaneously employed are, on the assumption made, identical or merely different expressions of the same fact. But when one turns to an examination of profit, where the amount of the total capital employed and the number of workers employed vary greatly for capitals of equal size, then the importance of the law becomes clear. Ricardo starts by considering commodities of a given value, that is to say, commodities which represent a given quantity of labor. And from this starting point, absolute and relative surplus value appear to be always identical. This, at any rate, explains the one-sidedness of his mode of procedure and corresponds with this whole method of investigation, to start with the value of the commodities as determined by the definite labor time they contain and then to examine to what extent this is affected by wages, profits, etc. This appearance is nevertheless false, since it is not a question of commodities here, but of capitalist production, of commodities as products of capital. Assume that a capital employs a certain number of workers, for example 20, and that wages amount to 20 pounds. To simplify matters, let us assume that the fixed capital is nil, i.e. we leave it out of account. Further, assume that these 20 workers spin 80 pounds of cotton into yarn, if they work 12 hours per day. If one pound of cotton costs one shilling, then 20 pounds costs one pound sterling, and 80 pounds sterling represents 1,600 pounds. If 20 workers spin 1,600 pounds in 12 hours, then they spin 133 and a third pounds in one hour. Thus, if the necessary labor time is 10 hours, then the surplus labor time is 2 hours, and this equals 266 and two-thirds pounds of yarn. The value of the 1,600 pounds would be 104 pounds sterling. For if 10 hours of work equal 20 pounds sterling, then one hour of work equals 2, and two hours of work 4, hence 12 are equal to 24. 80 pounds raw material and 24 pounds newly created value are equal to 104. But if each of the workers worked four hours of surplus labor, then their product would equal eight pounds sterling. I mean the surplus value which he creates. His product is in fact equal to 28. The total product would be 121 and a third pounds sterling. And this 121 and a third pounds would be the equivalent of 1,866 and two thirds pounds of yarn. As before, since the conditions of production remain the same, one pound of yarn would have the same value. It would contain the same amount of labor time. Moreover, according to the assumption, the necessary wages, their value, the labor time they contained, would have remained unchanged. Whether these 1,800 pounds of yarn were being produced under the first set of conditions or under the second, i.e. with two or with four hours of surplus labor, they would have the same value in both cases. The value, therefore, of the additional 266 and two-thirds pounds of cotton that are spun is 13 and one-third pounds sterling. This, added to the 80 pounds sterling for the 1,600 pounds cotton, amounts to 93 and one-third pounds sterling, and in both cases, four working hours more for 20 men amount to 8 pounds. Altogether, 28 pounds for the labor, that is 121 and one-fifth pounds. The wages are, in both cases, the same. The pound of yarn costs, in both cases, one and three-tenths of a shilling. Since the value of the pound of cotton is one shilling, what remained for the newly added labor in one pound of yarn would in both cases amount to three-tenths of a shilling, equal to three and three-fifths pence, or eighteen over five pence. Nevertheless, under the conditions assumed, the relation between value and surplus value in each pound of yarn would be very different. In the first case, since the necessary labor was equal to twenty pounds sterling, and the surplus labor to four pounds, or since the former amounted to ten hours and the latter to two hours, the ratio of surplus labor to necessary labor would be two to ten, or one-fifth. The three and three-fifths pence newly added labor in a pound of yarn would in this case contain one-fifth unpaid labor, that is, eighteen over twenty-five pence, or seventy-two over twenty-five farthings equal to two and twenty-two over twenty-five farthings. In the second case, on the other hand, the necessary labor would be 20 pounds, that is 10 working hours, the surplus labor 8 pounds, 4 working hours. The ratio of surplus labor to necessary labor would be 8 to 20, or 2 fifths. Thus, the 3 and 3 fifths pence of newly added labor in a pound of yarn would contain 2 fifths unpaid labor, i.e. 5 and 19 over 25 farthings. Although the yarn has the same value in both cases, and although the same wages are paid in both cases, the surplus value in a pound of yarn is in one case twice as large as in the other. The ratio of value of labor to surplus value is of course the same in the individual commodity, that is, in a portion of the product as in the whole product. In the one case, the capital advanced is 93 and one third pounds for cotton, and how much for wages? The wages for 1,600 pounds amount to 20 pounds sterling here, 
Hence, for the additional 266 and two thirds pounds, a further three and a third pounds sterling. This makes 23 and a third pounds, and the total capital outlay is 116 and two thirds pounds. The product comes to 121 and one third pounds. In the other case, however, the capital outlay would amount to only 113 and a third pounds, and four pounds would have to be added to the four pound surplus value. The same number of pounds of yarn are produced in both cases, and both have the same value, that is to say, they represent equal total quantities of labor. But these equal total quantities of labor are set in motion by capitals of unequal size, although the wages are the same, but the working days are of unequal length, and therefore unequal quantities of unpaid labor are produced. Taking the individual pound of yarn, the wages paid for it, or the amounts of paid labor a pound contains, are different. The same wages are spread over a larger volume of commodities here, not because labor is more productive in the one case than in the other, but because the total amount of unpaid labor which is set into motion in one case is greater than in the other. With the same quantity of paid labor, therefore, more pounds of yarn are produced in the one case than in the other, although in both cases the same quantities of yarn are produced, representing the same quantity of total labor, paid and unpaid. If, on the other hand, the productivity of labor had increased in the second case, then the value of the pound of yarn would at all events have fallen, whatever the ratio of surplus value to variable capital. In such a case, therefore, it would be wrong to say that the surplus value must be the same, and the two capitals, under otherwise equal conditions, would have produced the yarn with equal profits. This would be correct if we were concerned with one pound of yarn, but we are in fact concerned here with the capital which has produced 1,866 and two-thirds pounds of yarn. And in order to know the amount of profit, actually surplus value on one pound, we must know the length of the working day, or the quantity of unpaid labor when the productivity is given, that the capital sets in motion. But this information cannot be gathered by looking at the individual commodity. Thus, Ricardo deals only with what I have called the relative surplus value. From the outset, he assumes, as Adam Smith and his predecessors seem to have done as well, that the length of the working day is given. At most, Adam Smith mentions differences in the length of the working day in different branches of labor, which are leveled out or compensated by the relatively greater intensity of labor, difficulty, unpleasantness, etc. On the basis of this postulate, Ricardo, on the whole, explains relative surplus value correctly. Before we give the principal points of his theory, we shall cite a few more passages to illustrate Ricardo's point of view. The labor of a million men in manufactures will always produce the same value, but will not always produce the same riches. This means that the product of their daily labor will always be the product of a million working days containing the same labor time. This is wrong, or is only true where the same normal working day, taking into account the various difficulties, etc., in different branches of labor, has been generally established. Even then, however, the statement is wrong in the general form in which it is expressed here. If the normal working day is 12 hours, and the annual product of one man is in terms of money 50 pounds, and the value of money remains unchanged, then in this case, the product of 1 million men would always amount to 50 million pounds per year. If the necessary labor is 6 hours, then the capital laid out for these million men would be 25 million pounds per annum. The surplus value would also be 25 million. The product would always be 50 million, whether the workers received 25 or 30 or 40 million. But in the first case, the surplus value would be 25 million. In the second case, it would be 20 million, and in the third, 10 million. If the capital advanced consisted only of variable capital, i.e. only of the capital which is laid out in the wages of these 1 million men, then Ricardo would be right. He is therefore only right in the one case, where the total capital equals the variable capital a presupposition which pervades all his and Adam Smith's observations regarding the capital of society as a whole. But in capitalist production, this precondition does not exist in a single branch of industry, much less in the production of society as a whole. That part of the constant capital which enters into the labor process without entering into the process of the creation of value does not enter into the product, into the value of the product, and therefore, important as it is in the determination of the general rate of profit, it does not concern us here, where we are considering the value of the annual product. But matters are quite different with that part of constant capital which enters into the annual product. We have seen that a portion of this part of constant capital, or what appears as constant capital in one sphere of production, appears as a direct product of labor within another sphere of production, during the same production period of one year. 
a large part of the capital laid out annually, which appears to be constant capital from the standpoint of the individual capitalist of that particular sphere of production, therefore resolves itself into variable capital from the standpoint of society or of the capitalist class. This part is thus included in the 50 million, in that part of the 50 million which forms variable capital or is laid out in wages. But the position is different with that part of constant capital which is used up in order to replace the constant capital consumed in industry and agriculture with the consumed part of the constant capital employed in those branches of production which produce constant capital, raw material in its primary form, fixed capital and auxiliary materials. The value of this part reappears. It is reproduced in the product. In what proportion it enters into the value of the whole product depends entirely on its actual magnitude, provided the productivity of labor does not change. But however the productivity may change, this part of the constant capital will always have a definite magnitude. On the average, apart from certain exceptions in agriculture, the amount of the product, i.e. the riches, which Ricardo distinguishes from the value produced by one million men, will indeed also depend on the magnitude of this constant capital which is antecedent to production. This part of the value of the product would not exist without the new labor of the million men during the year. On the other hand, the labor of the million men would not yield the same amount of product without this constant capital which exists independently of their year's labor. It enters into the labor process as a condition of production, but not a single additional hour is worked in order to reproduce the value of this part. As value, it is therefore not the result of the year's labor, although its value would not have been reproduced without this year's labor. If the part of the constant capital which enters into the product were 25 million, then the value of the product of the 1 million men would be 75 million. If this part of the constant capital were 10 million, then the value of the product would only be 60 million, etc. And since the ratio of constant capital to variable capital increases in the course of capitalist development, the value of the annual product of a million men will tend to rise continuously in proportion to the growth of the past labor which plays a part in their annual production. This alone shows that Ricardo was unable to understand either the essence of accumulation or the nature of profit. With the growth in the proportion of constant to variable capital grows also the productivity of labor, the productive forces brought into being, with which social labor operates. As a result of this increasing productivity of labor, however, a part of the existing constant capital is continuously depreciated in value, for its value depends not on the labor time that it cost originally, but on the labor time with which it can be reproduced, and this is continuously diminishing as the productivity of labor grows. Although, therefore, the value of the constant capital does not increase in proportion to its amount, it increases nevertheless, because its amount increases even more rapidly than its value falls. But we shall return later to Ricardo's views on accumulation. It is evident, however, that if the length of the working day is given, the value of the annual product of the labor of one million men will differ greatly according to the different amount of constant capital that enters into the product, and that despite the growing productivity of labor, the value of this product will be greater where the constant capital forms a large part of the total capital than under social conditions where it forms a relatively small part of the total capital. With the advance in the productivity of social labor, accompanied as it is by the growth of constant capital, a relatively ever-increasing part of the annual product of labor will, therefore, fall to the share of capital as such, and thus property in the form of capital, apart from revenue, will be constantly increasing, and proportionately that part of value which the individual worker and even the working class creates will be steadily decreasing compared with the product of their past labor that confronts them as capital. The alienation and the antagonism between labor power and the objective conditions of labor which have become independent in the form of capital thereby grow continuously not taking into account the variable capital, i.e. that part of the product of the annual labor which is required for the reproduction of the working class. Even these means of subsistence, however, confront them as capital. Ricardo's view that the working day is given, limited, a fixed magnitude, is also expressed by him in other forms. For instance, where he says that the wages of labor and the profit of stock, quote, are together always of the same value, end quote. In other words, this only means that the daily labor time, whose product is divided between the wages of labor and the profits of stock, is always the same, is constant. Quote, wages and profits together will be the same value, end quote. I hardly need to repeat here that in these passages one should always read surplus value instead of profit. Quote, wages are to be estimated by their real value, that is, by the quantity of labor and capital employed in producing them, and not by their nominal value, either in coats, hats, money, or corn. 
The value of the means of subsistence which the worker obtains, that is, buys with his wages, corn, clothes, etc., is determined by the total labor time required for their production, the quantity of immediate labor as well as the quantity of materialized labor necessary for their production. But Ricardo confuses the issue because he does not state it plainly. He does not say their real value, that is, that quantity of the working day required to reproduce the value of the worker's own necessaries, the equivalent of the necessaries paid to them or exchanged for their labor. Real wages have to be determined by the average time which the worker must work each day in order to produce or reproduce his own wages. The laborer is only paid a really high price for his labor when his wages will purchase the produce of a great deal of labor. Section 4. Relative Surplus Value The analysis of relative wages is one of Ricardo's scientific achievements. This is, in fact, the only form of surplus value which Ricardo analyzes, under the name of profit. According to him, the quantity of labor required for the production of a commodity and contained in it determines its value, which is thus a given factor, a definite amount. This amount is divided between wage labor and capitalist. Ricardo, like Adam Smith, does not take constant capital into account here. It is obvious that the share of one can only rise or fall in proportion to the fall or rise of the share of the other. Since the value of the commodities is due to the labor of the workers, labor is under all circumstances the precondition of value, but there can be no labor unless the worker lives and maintains himself, i.e. receives the necessary wages, the minimum wages. Wages is synonymous with the value of his labor power. Wages and surplus value, these two categories into which the value of the commodity, or the product itself, is divided, are therefore not only in inverse proportion to each other, but the primary determinant factor is the movement of wages. Their rise or fall causes the opposite movement on the part of the profit, that is, surplus value. Wages do not rise or fall because profit falls or rises, but on the contrary, profit falls or rises because wages fall. The surplus product, which remains after the working class has received its share of its own annual production, forms the substance on which the capitalist class lives. Since the value of the commodities is determined by the quantity of labor contained in them, and since wages and surplus value are only shares, proportions in which the two classes of producers divide the value of the commodity between themselves, it is clear that a rise or fall in wages, although it determines the rate of surplus value, does not affect the value of the commodity, or the price, as the monetary expression of the value of a commodity. The proportion in which a whole is divided between two shareholders makes the whole neither larger nor smaller. It is, therefore, an erroneous preconception to assume that a rise in wages raises the price of commodities. It only makes profit fall. Even the exception cited by Ricardo, where a rise in wages is supposed to make the exchange values of some commodities fall and those of others rise, are wrong so far as value is concerned, and only correct for cost prices. Since the rate of surplus value is determined by the relative height of wages, how is the latter determined? Apart from competition, by the price of the necessary means of subsistence. This, in turn, depends on the productivity of labor, which increases with the fertility of the land. Ricardo assumes capitalist production here. Every improvement reduces the prices of commodities, of the means of subsistence. Wages, or the value of labor, thus rise and fall in inverse proportion to the development of the productive power of labor, insofar as the latter produces necessary means of subsistence which enter into the average consumption of the working class. The rate of surplus value falls or rises, therefore, in direct proportion to the development of the productive power of labor, because this development reduces or raises wages. The rate of profit cannot fall unless wages rise, and cannot rise unless wages fall. The value of wages has to be reckoned not according to the quantity of the means of subsistence received by the worker, but according to the quantity of labor which these means of subsistence cost. In fact, the proportion of the working day which he appropriates for himself that is, according to the relative share of the total product, or rather, of the total value of this product, which the worker receives. It is possible that reckoned in terms of use values, quantity of commodities or money, his wages rise as productivity increases, and yet the value of the wages may fall, and vice versa. It is one of Ricardo's great merits that he examined relative or proportionate wages and established them as a definite category. Up to this time, wages had always been regarded as something simple, and consequently the worker was considered an animal. But here he is considered in his social relationships. The position of the classes to one another depends more on relative wages than on the absolute amount of wages. Now these propositions have to be substantiated by quotations from Ricardo, 
the value of the deer, the produce of the hunter's day's labor, would be exactly equal to the value of the fish, the produce of the fisherman's day's labor. The comparative value of the fish in the game would be entirely regulated by the quantity of labor realized in each, whatever might be the quantity of production, or however high or low general wages and profits might be. If the fishermen employed ten men, whose annual labor cost one hundred pounds, and who in one day obtained by their labor twenty salmon, if the hunter also employed ten men, whose annual labor cost a hundred pounds, and who in one day procured him ten deer, then the natural price of a deer would be two salmon, whether the proportion of the whole produce bestowed on the men who obtained it were large or small. The proportion which might be paid for wages is of the utmost importance in the question of profits, for it must at once be seen that profits would be high or low exactly in proportion as wages were low or high. But it could not in the least affect the relative value of fish and game, as wages would be high or low at the same time in both occupations. It can be seen that Ricardo derives the whole value of the commodity from the labor of the men employed. It is their own labor, or the product of that labor, or the value of this product, which is divided between them and capital. No alteration in the wages of labor could produce any alteration in the relative value of these commodities, for suppose them to rise, no greater quantity of labor would be required in any of these occupations, but it would be paid for at a higher price. Wages might rise 20%, and profits consequently fall in a greater or less proportion, without occasioning the least alteration in the relative value of these commodities. There can be no rise in the value of labor without a fall of profits. If the corn is to be divided between the farmer and the laborer, the larger the proportion that is given to the latter, the less will remain for the former. So if cloth or cotton goods be divided between the workman and his employer, the larger the proportion given to the former, the less remains for the latter. Adam Smith and all the writers who have followed him have, without one exception that I know of, maintained that a rise in the price of labor would be uniformly followed by a rise in the price of all commodities. I hope I have succeeded in showing that there are no grounds for such an opinion. A rise of wages from the circumstances of the worker being more liberally rewarded or from a difficulty of procuring the necessaries on which wages are expended, does not, except in some instances, produce the effect of raising price, but has a great effect in lowering profits. The position is different, however, when the rise of wages is due to an alteration in the value of money. In the one case, no greater proportion of the annual labor of the country is devoted to the support of the laborers. In the other case, a larger portion is so devoted. With a rise in the price of food and necessaries, the natural price of labor will rise. With a fall in their price, the natural price of labor will fall. The surplus produce remaining, after satisfying the wants of the existing population, must necessarily be in proportion to the facility of production, that is, to the smaller number of persons employed in production. Neither the farmer who cultivates that quantity of land which regulates price nor the manufacturer who manufactures goods sacrifice any portion of the produce for rent. The whole of their commodities is divided into two portions only. One constitutes the profits of stock, the other the wages of labor. Suppose the price of silks, velvets, furniture, and any other commodities not required by the worker to rise in consequence of more labor being expended on them. Would not that affect profits? Certainly not, for nothing can affect profits but a rise in wages. Silks and velvets are not consumed by the laborer, and therefore cannot raise wages. If the labor of ten men will on land of certain quality obtain 180 quarters of wheat, and its value be four pounds per quarter, or 720 pounds, in all cases, the same sum of 720 pounds must be divided between wages and profits. Whether wages or profits rise or fall, it is this sum of 720 pounds from which they must both be provided. On the one hand, profits can never rise so high as to absorb so much of this 720 that enough will not be left to furnish the laborers with absolute necessaries. On the other hand, wages can never rise so high as to leave no portion of this sum for profits. Profits depend on high or low wages, wages on the price of necessaries, and the price of necessaries chiefly on the price of food, because all other requisites may be increased almost without limit. Although a greater value is produced, with the deterioration of the land, a greater proportion of what remains of that value after paying rent is consumed by the producers. He identifies laborers with producers here. And it is this and this alone which regulates profits, 
it is the essential quality of an improvement to diminish the quantity of labor before required to produce a commodity, and this diminution cannot take place without a fall of its price or relative value. Diminish the cost of production of hats, and their price will ultimately fall to their new natural price, although the demand should be doubled, tripled, or quadrupled. Diminish the cost of subsistence of men, and by diminishing the natural price of the food and clothing, by which life is sustained, and wages will ultimately fall, notwithstanding that the demand for laborers may very greatly increase. In proportion as less is appropriated for wages, more will be appropriated for profits, and vice versa. It has been one of the objects of this work to show that with every fall in the real value of necessaries, the wages of labor would fall, and that the profits of stock would rise. In other words, that of any given annual value, a less portion would be paid to the laboring class, and a larger portion to those whose funds employed this class. It is only in this statement, which has now become a commonplace, that Ricardo expresses the nature of capital, though he may not be aware of it. It is not accumulated labor which is employed by the laboring class, by the laborers themselves, but the funds, accumulated labor which employ this class, employ present immediate labor. Suppose the value of the commodities produced in a particular manufacture to be 1,000 pounds, and to be divided between the master and his laborers. Here again he expresses the nature of capital. The capitalist is the master, the workers are his laborers. In the proportion of 800 pounds to laborers and 200 to the master. If the value of these commodities should fall to 900, and 100 be saved from the wages of labor in consequence of the fall of necessaries, the net income of the masters would be in no degree impaired. If the shoes and clothing of the laborer could, by the improvements in machinery, be produced by one-fourth of the labor now necessary to their production, they would probably fall 75%. But so far is it from being true that the laborer would thereby be enabled to permanently consume four coats or four pairs of shoes instead of one, that it is probable his wages would in no long time be adjusted by the effects of competition, and the stimulus to population to the new value of the necessaries on which they were expended. If these improvements extended to all the objects of the laborer's consumption, we should find him probably, at the end of a very few years, in possession of only a small, if any, addition to his enjoyments, although the exchangeable value of those commodities, compared with any other commodity, had sustained a very considerable reduction, and though they were the produce of a very considerably diminished quantity of labor. When wages rise, it is always at the expense of profits, and when they fall, profits always rise. It has been my endeavor to show throughout this work that the rate of profits can never be increased but by a fall in wages, and that there can be no permanent fall of wages but in consequence of a fall of the necessaries on which wages are expended. If, therefore, by the extension of foreign trade, or by improvements in machinery, the food and necessaries of the worker can be brought to market at a reduced price, profits will rise. If, instead of growing our own corn or manufacturing the clothing and other necessaries of the worker, we discover a new market from which we can supply ourselves with these commodities at a cheaper price, wages will fall and profits rise. But if the commodity is obtained at a cheaper rate by the extension of foreign commerce or by the improvement of machinery, be exclusively the commodities consumed by the rich, no alteration will take place in the rate of profits. The rate of wages would not be affected although wine, velvets, silks, and other expensive commodities should fall 50%, and consequently profits would continue unaltered. Foreign trade, then, though highly beneficial to a country, as it increases the amount and variety of the objects on which revenue may be expended, and affords by the abundance and cheapness of commodities incentives to saving, and why not incentives to spending, and to the accumulation of capital, has no tendency to raise the profits of stock, unless the commodities imported be of that description on which the wages of labor are expended. The remarks which have been made respecting foreign trade apply equally to home trade. The rate of profits is never increased. He has just said the very opposite. Evidently, he means never unless the value of labor is diminished by the improvements mentioned. By a better distribution of labor, by the invention of machinery, by the establishment of roads and canals, or by any means of abridging labor in the manufacture or in the conveyance of goods. These are causes which operate on price and never fail to be highly beneficial to consumers, since they enable them, with the same labor, to obtain in exchange a greater quantity of the commodity to which the improvement is applied, but they have no effect whatever on profit. On the other hand, every diminution in the wages of labor raises profits, but produces no effect on the price of commodities, 
One is advantageous to all classes, for all classes are consumers. But how is it advantageous to the laboring class? For Ricardo presupposes that if these commodities enter into the consumption of the wage earner, they reduce wages. And if these commodities become cheaper without reducing wages, they are not commodities on which wages are expended. The other is beneficial only to producers. They gain more, but everything remains at its former price. Again, how is this possible, since Ricardo presupposes that the reduction of wages which raises profits takes place precisely because the price of the necessaries has fallen, and therefore by no means does everything remain at its former price? In the first case, they get the same as before, but everything, wrong again, should read everything with the exception of the necessaries, on which their gains are expended, is diminished in exchangeable value. It is evident that this passage is rather loosely worded, but apart from this formal aspect, the statements are only true if one reads rate of surplus value for rate of profit, and this applies to the whole of this investigation into relative surplus value. Even in the case of luxury articles, such improvements can raise the general rate of profit, since the rate of profit in these spheres of production, as in all others, bears a share in the leveling out of all particular rates of profit into the average rate of profit. If, in such cases, as a result of the above-mentioned influences, the value of the constant capital falls proportionately to the variable, or the period of turnover is reduced, i.e. a change takes place in the circulation process, then the rate of profit rises. Furthermore, the influence of foreign trade is expounded in an entirely one-sided way. The development of the product into a commodity is fundamental to capitalist production, and this is intrinsically bound up with the expansion of the market, the creation of the world market, and therefore foreign trade. Apart from this, Ricardo is right when he states that all improvements, be they brought about through the division of labor, improvements in machinery, the perfection of means of communication, foreign trade, in short, all measures that reduce the necessary labor time involved in the manufacture or transport of commodities, increase the surplus value, hence profit, and thus enrich the capitalist class, because, and insofar as, these improvements reduce the value of labor. Finally, in this section, we must quote a few passages in which Ricardo analyzes the nature of relative wages. If I have to hire a laborer for a week, and instead of ten shillings I pay him eight, no variation having taken place in the value of money, the laborer can probably obtain more food and necessaries with his eight shillings than he before obtained for ten. But this is owing not to a rise in the real value of his wages, as stated by Adam Smith, and more recently by Mr. Malthus, but to a fall in the value of the things on which his wages are expended, things perfectly distinct. And yet, for calling this a fall in the real value of wages, I am told that I adopt new and unusual language, not reconcilable with the true principles of the science. It is not by the absolute quantity of produce obtained by either class that we can correctly judge of the rate of profit, rent, and wages, but by the quantity of labor required to obtain that produce, by improvements in machinery and agriculture, the whole produce may be doubled, but if wages, rent, and profit be also doubled, these three will bear the same proportions to one another as before, and neither could be said to have relatively varied. But if wages partook not of the whole of this increase, if they, instead of being doubled, were only increased one half, it would, I apprehend, be correct for me to say that wages had fallen while profits had risen. For if we had an invariable standard by which to measure the value of this produce, we should find that a less value had fallen to the class of laborers, and a greater to the class of capitalists than had been given before. It will not the less be a real fall, because the wages might furnish him with a greater quantity of cheap commodities than his former wages. De Quincey points out the contrast between some of the propositions developed by Ricardo and those of the other economists. Quote, when it was asked, by the economist before Ricardo, what determined the value of all commodities, it was answered that this value was chiefly determined by wages. When again it was asked, what determined wages, it was recollected that wages must be adjusted to the value of the commodities upon which they were spent, and the answer was in effect that wages were determined by the value of commodities. The same Dialogues contains the following passage about the law governing the measurement of value by the quantity of labor and by the value of labor. So far are the two formulas from presenting merely two different expressions of the same law that the very best way of expressing negatively Mr. Ricardo's law, 
that is, A is to B in value as the quantities of producing labor, would be to say, A is not to B in value as the values of producing labor. If the organic composition of the capital in A and B were the same, then it could, in fact, be said that their relation to one another is proportionate to the values of the producing labor, for the accumulated labor in each would be the same in proportion as the immediate labor in each. The quantities of paid labor in each, however, would be proportionate to the total quantities of immediate labor in each. Assume the composition to be 80 constant and 20 variable, and the rate of surplus value equal to 50%. If one capital were equal to 500 pounds and the other to 300, then the product in the first case would be 550 and in the second 330. The products would then be as 100, wages, to 60, that is, as 5 to 3. But even then, one would only know their relation to one another and not their true values, since many different values correspond to the ratio 5 to 3. If the price is 10 shillings, then wages and profits, taken as a whole, cannot exceed 10 shillings, but do not the wages and profits as a whole themselves, on the contrary, predetermine the price? No, that is the old, superannuated doctrine. The new economy has shown that all price is governed by proportional quantity of the producing labor, and by that only. Being itself once settled then, ipso facto, price settles the fund out of which both wages and profits must draw their separate dividends. Any change that can disturb the existing relations between wages and profits must originate in wages. Ricardo's doctrine is new insofar as he poses the question whether in fact it sets aside the law of actual value. 